So the next item of business is the second stage of the Housing Amendment Bill. I call the Minister for Communities to move the motion. The second stage of the bill has been moved. In accordance with convention, the Business Committee has not allocated any time limit on this debate. I call the Minister for Communities, Mrs Deidre Hargey, to open the debate on the bill. Minister. Thanks very much. Um, and again, just thank you to members. And I suppose just to go back over what was previously said, ONS published its decision on the 29th of September 2016 to change the classification of registered housing associations from private to public sector. And obviously the executive at that time um, started work to facilitate the reversal. The executive again effectively repeated this commitment and the new decade new approach and this committed to us bringing forward legislation which is urgently needed to reclassify housing associations as external to the public sector to ensure the continuation of new social housing building and co-ownership housing scheme. The executive decided uh, to seek reversal um, of the classification lens to its development of new social homes through housing associations. A private sector classification has long enabled housing associations to complement with their own borrowings the capital that the executive has allocated to the development of new social homes. These borrowings did not score as public borrowing due to associations' private sector classification, but they would under a public sector classification. Under Treasury borrowing rules, DFC would need to retain in its capital allocation a sum equivalent to the association's annual borrowing while they are classified to the public sector. This would remove entirely the advantage to the government and the social housing sector of the association's ability to fund new uh, social bills. The building of all new social homes would need to be entirely funded by the executive. Since the ONS decision, um, the British government has prevented the ONS decision from having this effect on the executive's budget by applying a derogation. Treasury uh, terms for this derogation required the executive must, in the meantime, expedite legislation that would reform the relationship between it and the associations, as, um, so as to permit ONS to return registered housing associations to the private sector classification. The current derogation expires on 31 March 2021, and it is unlikely that there would be a further extension to this classification. And to put this in context, um, had the 2019-20 um, been negatively affected uh, in this way, then the £146 million of capital that my department has allocated to new social housing bills could not have been matched by similar sums of borrowing by housing associations. Instead of supporting a target of 1,850 new bill starts, only half of that, about half of that, um, of the number of bills would have been affordable. At a time when the waiting list for social uh, homes continues to increase, this is clearly an unacceptable situation. Since 2016, it has become clear that ONS's classification of registered housing associations to the public sector has made them ineligible to access financial transactions capital or FTC loan funding. This access to FTC has supported housing uh, tenures other than social rented, the most significant of which is co-ownership scheme. Within the last two years, this scheme has supported over 2,000 households into home ownership. And from April 2015, the scheme has utilised an FTC loan to do this. However, from November 18, my department maintained delivery of intermediate shared ownership houses at these levels through securing an additional 49 million of Capital Dale grants, approximately 15 million in 1819, and a, 30, a further 34 million in 1920. The alternative would have been the closure of the scheme for new applications. Unless a private sector classification is returned to housing associations, then the closure or still further pressure on Capital Dale are the only options for 2020, 2021 and beyond. Social and economic benefits are at the heart of reclassification of this legislation. The economic benefits, the use of capital Dell to leverage inward, inward commercial investment, the financial transactions capital that can once again be drawn down, will now take on additional relevance insofar as they will add to the economic recovery from COVID-19. 
The scope of the bill, it may be helpful just to spend a few minutes to go through uh, the detail of the scope of the bill. So ONS determined that uh, housing associations should be classified to public sector because they observed the level of control of housing associations by the executive through my department not to be consistent with a private sector classification. This is why the sole focus on the draft bill is to remove or amend those provisions in current housing legislation that provide for this control. As England, Scotland and Wales have also um, had the same reclassification decision made by ONS, there was regular liaison between officials here and also in those three other areas. This forum allowed the Department to learn from other experiences and to gain an insight into the legislative amendments that ONS considered to be acceptable in terms of reversing their decision. The issue of the house sale schemes was unique as we are the only uh, jurisdiction or local authority with a compulsory scheme uh, for registered housing associations. The draft bill um, that this work has produced has eight substantive clauses and three technical clauses. There's also a short schedule. The explanatory and financial memorandum published alongside the bill provide for detailed explanation of the bill and if I can briefly outline, outline the main impacts. Firstly, the current consent process for a number of functions carried out by housing associations will be replaced by a notifications process. Secondly, the circumstances in which the housing regulator may launch an inquiry into the activities of an association are more clearly framed and based in uh, failure or suspected failure to comply with legislation. Thirdly, the bill removes the power of the Department of Petition for the winding up of an association, a power that has never been used. Creditor bodies could still do this. Finally, the bill proposes to end statutory house sale scheme for housing associations and introduce a power to enable the Department to support a voluntary house sale scheme should the associations develop a substitute one. The bill will not decrease the regulatory authority exercised by the housing regulator and does not diminish the relationship between the tenant and the association, nor the tenant's ability to engage with the regulator. The approach in the legislation has been based on the direction from the executive as far back as September 2016 and does not, and does not only um, that which is necessary to achieve the reversal of the ONS uh, decision. This is why the bill uh, proposes changes to current compulsory uh, sales scheme, house sales scheme uh, for registered housing associations, but not for the housing executive itself. I will in due course consult on methods of entry to affordable home ownership, both on extending existing schemes and introducing new alternative options, particularly for social tenants who wish to become homeowners. This consultation will be brought forward in the coming months and will include consideration of how best to protect the social housing stock and of the future of the Housing Executive's House Sales Scheme. And I am happy um, to deal with any points of principles by members. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Communities Committee, Mrs Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker, the Committee for Communities <coughs> welcomes this bill. Indeed, given the important issues this bill addresses, we anticipated that we would have already considered it, given it was a key priority at the start of this Assembly. In September, it will be four years since the Office of National Statistics took the decision to reclassify registered housing associations to the public sector and designate them as public non-financial corporations. I think it's important to recognise that on one level, this was a decision taken in order to align with technical accounting rules, but it does and has had a significant impact on the housing sector. The key purpose of the bill is, of course, to make the required changes to ensure that the ONS will reverse that decision and returning housing associations to the private sector. As noted in the debate on the previous motion, the committee was briefed by the Minister on May 13. During that briefing, the Minister noted a number of reasons why accelerated passage was required, and those issues were also <coughs> pertained to this second stage of debate. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, housing associations normally raise money through the private sector in order to match fund the housing grant from the Department. If the decision is not reversed, housing associations will not be able to do that 
and the number of social housing starts will significantly, significantly reduce by as much as 50 per cent. In addition, housing associations will lose eligibility to access financial transactions capital, a government loan scheme which is primarily used to support the co-ownership scheme. Despite the derogation from the Treasury, housing associations have not been able to access this scheme. The Committee was advised that it currently costs the Department £3 million per month to maintain the co-ownership scheme. That is not sustainable, and in these uncertain times, that money could be used to fund other priorities. At the heart of the ONS decision lay the degree of control that the Department exercises over housing associations. The greater control, then the more likely ONS could, would not reverse its decision. So, of course, the Committee was concerned that the Department should still be able to exercise sufficient regular, re regulatory control over housing associations, particularly given the large amount of public money that sector receives. The Department advised the Committee that the ONS looked at the current regulatory system and proposed changes to that regulatory system and were content with what the Department was proposing. So the Committee was reassured that regulation will continue broadly in the same way as we have now. However, a key issue for members was the decision to abolish the right to buy scheme in relation to housing associations homes. This was covered in Clause 7. Some members saw this as a popular scheme that gives people a foot on the property ladder. Others, it was, uh, others said it contributed to the reduction in our social housing stock. Arguably, both of these positions are true, but the committee was advised that if this, position, if this provision was not included, then ONS would not reverse its September 2016 decision. It is also worth noting that there are between 20 and 60 housing association properties sold annually, whereas there are between 200 and 400 housing executive properties sold. That is important because the ending of the right to buy scheme will apply only to tenants within the housing association sector and not the tenants in housing executive accommodation. That, run the that runs the risk of inequality if not addressed soon, and the Minister has given her assurances that this will be addressed. However, for the main purpose of the bill, the committee was told that it is not required. I should also point out, uh, point out that for those considering buying a housing association house, there is a two-year transitional period within which tenants can register an interest to purchase. It is not the case that contracts have to be exchanged within that two-year time frame. Registered housing associations will, however, be able to operate a voluntary right to buy scheme and Clause 8 will allow the Department to pay a grant in support of a voluntary housing scheme and the Committee welcomes this. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the house housing is a multifaceted issue which, in normal circumstances, would be a key priority for the Committee. COVID-19 has temporarily put pay to that, but the Committee looks forward to engaging with the Department and stakeholders on housing over the rest of this Assembly mandate. This is something I know that the Minister has advised she also wants to make progress on. However, in relation to this second stage debate, the Committee is supportive of the Bill. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Ennis. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and, and I think I have to, to say, to start off with, um, that I do find the intervention by my colleague on the um, Committee for Communities a bit bizarre. Um, and given his long preamble about you know, the uh, uh, housing being an uh, equality issue, that he was um, attempting to, to jeopardise the accelerated passage of this bill, which will see, if that, if that was to happen, approximately 20 million um, being taken out of the social housing budget. And considering he, he didn't mention any of these concerns when we spoke about it at the committee, I do find it a bit, a bit bizarre. So, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure the member will explain that. In his, I'm sure the member will explain that in his contribution. So, I'll leave that to him. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, the Minister for her, her fast and decisive action uh, so far in providing the utmost support uh, for our housing providers and, and those struggling to obtain a home, um, either through home ownership or social housing. Um, this bill is about maintaining the supply um, of new homes necessary to help struggling families, along with our most vulnerable, to access housing um, and have uh, security and dignity of a home. Um, 
If classified as public bodies, housing associations lose the ability to borrow from the financial transaction uh, capital, as all borrowing would have to count as public sector borrowing. In real terms, this would reduce the number of social homes by approximately 50% each year and would dramatically reduce funding for the co-ownership scheme. We know that every year um, 60 housing association, home, housing association homes and 30 housing executive homes are sold and that that stock is never replaced. And how many families are already struggling to obtain their own home in unfair conditions of overcrowding and young families still being penalised for the housing crash over a decade ago? This Assembly must ensure the maximum delivery of social and afford affordable homes for our citizens in what will be undoubtedly a very tough and uncertain period ahead. Thank you. I call Mr. Mark Durkin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, in the previous debate, I acknowledged the importance of this bill and the hugely significant role that it will play in enabling us to build more home houses and provide more homes. We all know people who have spent years and years on the list waiting for a home, families who, without the security of somewhere they can call their own, have run the gauntlet of the private rental sector, others living in overcrowded conditions with their extended families and friends. We are failing these people. So any measure that can and will help us to help them is to be supported. In the previous debate, I also acknowledged that this bill is far from perfect, and I'm not the only one with questions about it. Some members will have received uh, the same correspondence that, that I have from Housing Rights ANI, who share many of the concerns raised by committee members. The primary concerns seem to focus on Clause 7 of the Bill, the abolition of the mandatory right to buy in housing associations, or sorry, the move to make it voluntary. The right to buy scheme has been popular, and members touched on that at committee. It has allowed people an affordable way onto the housing market, and most of us know many, many people who have availed of and benefited uh, from it. However, the right to buy is trumped every time in my book by the right to a roof over your head. We cannot afford to continue to sell off social housing stock while need increases, and we are not able to build anywhere near enough homes to meet that need. It's difficult to understand, given that there has previously been extensive consultation on this, why the Minister does not take the opportunity in that this bill presents to make the scheme voluntary for all social landlords. By excluding the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, by retaining the ma mandatory right to buy for NIHE tenants, you are creating an inequality in access to both social housing and ownership. This could very likely also have implications for the administration of the social housing allocation system. Might some people actually reject what, to all extents and purposes, is a reasonable offer of a housing association property while they wait for an offer of a housing executive home that they can ultimately own? As things stand, there are around 10 times as many Northern Ireland housing executive properties sold every year than uh, housing association properties. At committee, I did seek and received an assurance from the Minister that she will address the housing executive situation in the near future. And we do need to hear more detail on that, and we need to hear it soon. Does the Minister intend to, or does she envisage, the ultimate reclassification of the housing executive, taking it out of the public sector borrowing requirements, and a remodelling that would allow it to borrow and build much needed homes and build communities as they do so well. So an update on the social housing reform program would be very welcome from the Minister today. I'm conscious that it might be coming across a bit curmudgeonly today, that's not the intention, believe me, but it is important that the weaknesses in any legislation are flagged up as they're debated, as it's debated in this House. Clause 8 appears to allow the Department to compensate housing associations who continue to operate a voluntary right to buy scheme. But how will that work? What measures will exist to prevent associations picking what homes that they want to sell based sheerly on profitability, selling off better homes 
but happy to retain homes of a lower standard for social housing tenants. Despite the fact that we will now not have a committee stage, I am and we are happy to work with any and every member here and the Minister to consider how this bill may be strengthened. This should not detract from or distract from my support from the bill's aim to reverse the ONS reclassification. We need to empower our housing providers to build more and we need to use every legislative tool at our disposal to do so. We support the work of housing associations and co-ownership. We have heard the cost £3 million per month of not doing this. But for how many months have we been paying this £3 million? This legislation, like so much important legislation, has been delayed because we had no assembly. So, in response to Ms Ennis, I did ask officials on the financial cost of this delay and was given a rough estimate of £40 million thus far. In terms of social cost, one of the Minister's officials computed that 700 fewer social homes had been built, or sorry, 700 social homes had not been built as a direct consequence of the Pyrrhic political standoff between Sinn Féin and the DUP that left the people of the North without an assembly. But we have moved on, I hope, and now we must focus on making things right. The Minister and Chair have outlined the benefits of this bill, and there are many. We and our constituents cannot afford for this bill not to pass, and we will be supporting the bill. Thank you. I call Mr. Andy Allen. Well, Deputy Speaker, uh, and firstly, uh, before going into the detail of the bill, uh, I would like to place on record I can understand and fully appreciate the position of the member across the way. Under normal circumstances, we would not like to see this bill progressing by accelerated passage. But I, I do understand where you're coming from, although I take a slightly different position under the current circumstances. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I welcome the bill that the Minister has brought forward. It, it's good to see it introduced in this House some nearly four years on since the, the original decision by ONS. Um, we were promised it on numerous occasions throughout the course of the previous mandates, and regretfully, um, we weren't here for a period of three years when we should have been dealing with these, these, uh, these topics and these important measures. We're all very cognizant of the various and profound issues that have been highlighted by the Minister, the, the Committee Chair and my committee colleague across the way, the impact in which uh, failure to achieve the reversal of a reclassification will have upon many of our constituents right across Northern Ireland, the impact of the financial transactions capital and the impact um, for the many thousands, tens of thousands of individuals and families on ho social housing waiting lists right across Northern Ireland. We feel that the bill before us uh, and the substantive clauses, the majority of those, are, are, are all necessary, they are proportionate in measure, and it is welcome that we will still see uh, regulatory oversight of housing associations. The majority of housing associations all operate in, in a good manner. I have had very, very good dealings with housing associations when engaging with them on behalf of constituents. I can say that, thankfully, to, this, to date, I have not had a negative experience, and they have always been proactive and willing to engage to resolve any issues. My party, and indeed I, are, are on the record in our position in respect of the Right to Buy scheme. We, we, we recognise that the Right to Buy was not perfect. It was not a utopia. There was problems in the Right to Buy system. No, no one is denying that. But it did provide an opportunity for those who wish to get on the, the housing ladder that opportunity to do so. But we do fully understand and appreciate the necessity within this bill to abolish the right to buy scheme. And we do re reluctantly support that. But, but in turn, we welcome the voluntary scheme. And as the, my colleague across the way has pointed out, however, some further detail would be, would be good. And I, I raised that in the committee to the minister and the officials, and they said they would come back with that information. So that would be really helpful as to how that's going to be administered. What would the grants look like? And what form would they take? Uh, as the, the members pointed out across the way, um, how, how will it be decided? What housing stock will be sold, etc., etc.? We will support the bill, and indeed, I am happy to work with any member who wants to strengthen the bill. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mrs. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, today, this Housing Amendment Bill will take forward change to the way housing associations are designated. Um, 
As others have mentioned, it has been some time coming, and I would like to thank the Minister for bringing it forward. Um, I appreciate that accelerated passage, and I've said it before, is not the way to go, but in this instance it is. Um, this will allow social housing to continue to receive funding and will enable co-ownership to continue to help people to buy their own home. Um, one issue of note today um, has been mentioned by others is Clause 7. The statutory house sales scheme will be abolished. The right to, be, to buy may continue if the Social Housing Association chooses to, to take forward a voluntary scheme. Alliance recognises that many people have availed of the system, but recognises that the lack of replacement builds has meant a 42.5% increase in social housing stress waiting lists from 2009 to 2019. The housing executives still will be able to sell off their homes. We need to align social housing and the housing executive right to buy, and I encourage the Minister to complete the review of the housing executive as soon as practical. I also would like to highlight the fact that in the new decade, new approach agreement, it included an agreement for a housing outcome to be added to the programme for government. And I appreciate while we are going through this pandemic, there still needs to be work done to prepare to ensure that housing is treated as a priority and will, be, will appear in the updated programme for government. As raised by others, I would like the Minister to work with social housing to ensure that any future voluntary scheme for a right to buy includes a requirement to deliver inclusive and cohesive communities by ensuring mixed tenure is maintained. I absolutely welcome um, what's coming with this bill because it means that our construction industry can start to see there is a market there, there is work for them to do and we'll be able to provide the funding for them. It is a difficult one to take forward as an urgent case, but it makes sense. We need to deal with the ONS reclassification, and we need to do it as quickly as possible. And thank you for bringing it forward, Minister. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And again, I rise in this House to support uh, this piece of legislation to reverse the ONS decision to reclassify registered housing associations to the public sector and designate them as public non-financial corporations. In, in doing so, I support its purpose, as there is clearly the need for us to be able to invest uh, in our, uh, housing stock, our social housing stock and invest for the future, and we know the housing stress that exists at present. But in doing so, I, I do so in terms of the, the, the way in which we have progressed this is accelerated passage, I do so with considerable regret that we've had to go down this avenue. And I have some considerable uh, agreement with my colleague for uh, Foyle, Mr Durkin, in relation to the, the lack of scrutiny that we have been able to have in relation to this crucial piece of legislation. We've already heard its need. We know that it has done the rounds uh, for many years now in this place. But for people like myself who are new to the committee, etc., we have not had the ability to scrutinise this housing sector in the way in which I believe we should. It must be noted, and it, it has to be said, that we can't continue to uh, scrutinise important pieces of legislation via telephone conference. I understand that uh, it's there at the moment in relation to COVID-19, but this is now, this is too important. We, we, eyes must uh, be over this entire piece of legislation. While we did have a briefing from the Minister on the 13th of May, which we appreciated, it was an opportunity for members to put on record their concerns. And, and uh, despite what uh, Ms. Dennis said, I, I, there was concern from con committee members uh, as to the purpose uh, and intention of the different elements and clauses within this bill. But the point is that uh, for to go forward, as the Minister has recommended, the reason why we can support accelerated passage is because of those points that she mentions, that £3 million uh, per month um, is, is being uh, wasted. Uh, why this decision does not be overturned and the potential threat of derogation uh, being withheld. I want to move on to a, a clause in which I have been on record in the committee, and it does cause me considerable regret, I suppose, and that is in relation to the abolishment or proposed abolishment of the right to buy scheme. For many, it was a contentious scheme, but for me, I recognise it for what I have seen it as, which was a very popular policy, which enjoyed widespread support for those that could only once have dreamed of getting their foot on the property ladder. Uh, and this, is, it, this policy 
of right to buy enable them not only to get on the housing ladder, but also have an asset in which they could uh, leave to future generations in, in relation to family, etc. And it's something that many of them had worked for and worked towards all their lives. It also uh, provided them with financial security that home ownership does, and we all know uh, that importance of that ability to, to own an asset such as a home that can potentially be used to uh, move people off the, the need and care of the state towards a, a private owned uh, asset of their own. One of the important points to bear witness to as well is that it, it, has, it has been noted that those that own an asset, whether it's a home or whatever, they have that sense of ownership and that sense of care and attention and community roots were laid in, in communities right across Northern Ireland because of this policy which allowed individuals the ability to own their own homes. A further point that I would like to just again uh, reiterate my concern to is in relation to Clause 8, because Clause 8 is included to allow the Department to, to pay grants to support voluntary schemes, but there is very little detail provided both in the Bill and the explanatory note and in relation to the Committee uh, as to what sort of schemes would be going forward, because this is something that I would like clarity from, from the Department and the Minister, because if we are moving towards a situation where right to buy scheme has to be abolished uh, under this bill because the ONS classifies that as overarching control and therefore it is that decision that is probably key to moving it towards uh, reversing this decision. But the committee has had no viewing of what potential schemes or otherwise could be put in place to allow people uh, to avail of that potential in the future. While I recognise that uh, the right to buy will not be abolished for, for two years, I think, in process, uh, does give people some security to get onto the scheme, but it's for future generations that I think about and the, the, the right and the, the ability to own their own homes. Um, so I would appreciate if the Minister could maybe give us further clarity on Clause 8 uh, and it, its meaning. And obviously, uh, as this applies to the registered housing associations, further discussion will be had both here in this House and indeed committee in the future in relation to the housing executive. And again, I would hope that we are not in a situation where we are again going towards accelerated passage within this House without carefully examining each and every facet of uh, potential proposed legislation to ensure that uh, we give people the ability to eventually own their own home through these schemes which have been so popular. On that point, Mr Speaker, I thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Emma Sheeran. Um, I stand today to support the bill. As a rural representative where young people in particular struggle to get their feet on the property ladder, um, I would support this bill to avoid that, the halving of the social housing programme. We have had now over 10 years of austerity where prices keep rising and wages do not, and more and more people are finding that their grown up children, and I would know because I am one of them, are still living in their home house. Uh, as they approach their, their 30s and, and indeed into them. In rural areas, a lack of building in small towns and villages means that most people only do have two options available to them. Move to where there is affordable housing or wait it out. And housing lists in small rural uh, villages are not always a true depiction or reflection because people, when they are applying for, for housing, are told that they are unavailable in their locality and thus they pick somewhere uh, five or six or ten miles down the road. So if you're not lucky enough to inherit a site or to have a site that you can get planning permission on, or if you're not lucky enough to have the thousands that it requires to build a home, you have to stick it out. And, and this is unfair. And we've discussed there the, the lack of housing. And this reclassification would leave the executive funding the entire new build programme, which potentially reduces the number of new builds from over 1,800 to 900. So in rural areas, we need more building, not less. And I would support the bill for that reason. Thank you. I call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I begin by acknowledging the remarks already made regarding the death of George Floyd. Um, in this place, we know the importance of civil rights and the implementation of them. And the scenes from America are harrowing and a throwback to a time that we all hoped that we had moved from. Uh, moving to the, uh, mo the motion, the bill today, at its core, it is about the ability to deliver new homes going forward. Uh, social homes, home for which there is already a distinct shortage of in our community. 
how many of us in this House are not regularly contacted by people asking are there social houses available, how do I get my name down for a new development or when will a new development in our area commence. And we all know too of the sterling work undertaken on the streets of our towns and cities to manage homelessness and of the many hundreds if not thousands more whose sofa surf because of a lack of a home. The need is present in our community for new homes and we must deliver that and remove barriers that are preventing new homes and this bill aims to address that. Now, the bill has some imperfections and the nature of it being accelerated concerns us. Uh, the bill in essence is not needed until the 31st of March next year and some more time to scrutinise it would have been better if only to allow us to draw on the expertise that there is out there amongst the housing sector that could have helped inform and make sure that this bill was as watertight and as good as it could be going forward. The reclassification proposed in this bill allows registered housing associations to borrow money. It is something that they have always done in the past, and this bill aims to reverse a bad decision that was taken a few years ago, uh, which was more to do with what was happening elsewhere rather than here. That decision could have massive ramifications. For example, in 2019-2020, $146 million was borrowed by uh, housing associations, and with the change to the rules implemented going forward, that would have resulted in a massive real-term hit to the budgets of housing associations but more importantly resulting in them not being able to build new homes and reach the target that the executive has set for new builds. Much of the previous money borrowed was from FTC, the financial transaction capital money, and we know what the perception is of that money being handed back. Last year, $150 million was. Imagine if we could have directed that to our housing sector. And much of that that was borrowed funded co-ownership which in the past two years has delivered 2,145 houses. What would our future be if we can't deliver that level of housing? Over 2,000 families stuck in older housing, maybe unfit properties, maybe not where they want to be. Surely our measure as a society is our ability to deliver on housing. Without change uh, that this bill proposes, we will be unable to get the much-needed finance into our housing system, and this will mean that we will miss our target of 1,850 new builds per year. In fact, the SDLP wants to see a stronger and higher target, and we also want to see the inclusion of the housing indicator in the programme for government, so we haven't finished on that ask yet either. Such an indicator would be a clear indication from this executive that it is serious about housing provision and that will be underpinned by the need for the all-essential cash. There is real housing stress in our communities and, as I have said, there is hardly one of us in this chamber that is not contacted daily about housing. The need for a house, the need for an upgrade to a house, uh, maybe the wish to move out of a particular area because it is bad for people's health, maybe bad for their mental health. And we hear also through processes like Bingoa that the type of upbringing that children have can dictate their future health needs. And one core element of how children are brought up is the roof over their head and the fact that it's a good, modern, high quality home in a nice community that is well out, laid out and looked after. That will certainly give children a much better start in their life. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the quality of the existing stock is diminishing too. Many of the Northern Ireland housing executive houses are getting old and they are not able to build new homes. This means that the cost of repairs is increasing and that is zapping up the budget of the housing executive. Also, many of the developments that we, they have reflect the old North, the Northern Ireland of the past, and are in segregated areas that do not look to the future that we want to see in the North. Only new developments away from contentious areas, away from flashpoints and peace walls can embrace the new Ireland that we would like to seek. These new communities can live side by side with emerging communities too. And again, all of that is underpinned by on the capacity and ability of housing associations to be able to build new houses, new developments and new communities and create that future. The Housing Amendment Bill may not sound glamorous, but this is a bill that unleashes the potential of the North, and therefore we support it. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mrs. Martina Anderson. Going me August the last three can call you, but while I'm Lord a father, a Bill Shaw, I want to speak in favour of this bill. 
But I also want, as I stand here this morning, to send my deepest sympathy to the family and friends of George Floyd and to say to those on the streets protesting that black lives matter. Across the island of Ireland, uh, we are in the midst of a housing crisis. But in the north of Ireland, if we reflect back in 2002, there were over 13,000 people in housing stress. And by 2019, that has skyrocketed to over 26,000 people. Now, without this bill, the reclassification of the Registered Housing Association by the British government would deepen the housing crisis and would half the annual amount of council housing that is built in the north. In my opinion, my constituents, our constituents in Derry, would absolutely understand the need for accelerated passage. No one likes accelerated passage. We all like the opportunity to scrutinise and scrutinise properly. But we would understand it because people do not want the opportunity for co-ownership to close. 21 million we're hearing would have to come out of the social housing development programme if that did not happen in the context of uh, COVID-19. Now that is a lot of money. So money I know that is needed for the social housing and development programme in places like Derry and North Belfast. Furthermore, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to say, given the objections that has been made, previous SDLP ministers, in fact, previous SDLP social development ministers, used the accel accelerated passage mechanism, uh, and that was without COVID. So I want to acknowledge the clause. Go ahead. Thank the, the member for giving away. Obviously, I, I referred in my speech in the second debate, and this debate, sorry, to the need to use every legislative tool at our disposal to help our constituents, so many of whom, and you gave a figure there, uh, Ms Anderson, of 26,000, are in housing uh, need. Of course, we must. Accelerate the passage as a legislative tool. Yes, it is one that all our ministers will have used from every party at different stages uh, during the lifetime of this Assembly. However, would the member not concur with me that it is vitally important that we get any legislation right? And uh, what we're talking about here is not a, a, a huge delay, but merely to afford committee members and MLAs who aren't on the committee the opportunity to scrutinise fully and hear evidence from the sector, experts in the field, and even the housing executive on the implications of this on the wider housing sector. Well, I'm hoping that it's not the dialogue of the deaf, because I did say uh, that we do want to scrutinise. As MLAs, we all want to be involved in proper scrutiny and we want to make sure that legislation goes through in the way that affords us the opportunity to engage with uh, people. But no one wants to see an opportunity of co-ownership being lost or to close. And we don't want to see 21 million, up to 21 million, that would have to come out of the social housing and development programme uh, if this didn't happen. I also want to acknowledge the clause in the bill uh, which would abolish the compulsory right to buy scheme for registered housing associations. And this was a policy that was introduced by Margaret Thatcher and has helped to ground down the, the supply of social housing in the north. Now, once the scheme is good and have given people a chance to buy their, their social home at a discount, as has been said. In practice, it also facilitated private uh, companies siphoning off uh, public access uh, to make a profit. And, you know, home ownership is, without doubt, it's a good thing. But I know I've been dealing with constituents, and I'm sure other MLAs have been as well, that many people who wanted to own their own home and who couldn't afford to do so were enticed by the private sector with conditional loans, uh, which enabled them to live in the house until they died, uh, after which the house would be transferred to the private sector. So this is housing stock that's never really uh, replaced, and uh, that policy um, has never really, was never really, I believe, about 
uh, home ownership on its own. It was an attempt to turn social housing, some aspects of it, into what I would describe as something like the wild west of unbridled um, capitalism, where greed, greed times needs. No, you've had enough times, uh, Minister. Um, I'm sorry, Minister, I am glad that the bill will help put an end to two uh, policies uh, that threaten the provision of social housing. But I am aware, um, and I'm sure you're, you would agree, that much more needs to be done. And I think that's something, as MLAs, we're all crucially conscious of. We need to increase our social housing stock because access to adequate housing is a human right. A human right, uh, one that I believe that everyone in this chamber would, uh, would support and concur with. In my constituency in Derry, in 2019, there were 4,510 people on the housing waiting list. In the same year, only 1,231 people were housed. Derry has one of the highest rates of homelessness in the entire north and one of the lowest rates of new plans approved to build additional social housing. In fact, due to nearly a decade of Tory austerity and the implication of austerity slashing things like NA water budget, even when social housing is planned in, in Derry, building uh, is stalled. I'm sure it's not just in Derry, but that is certainly the case in my own constituency, because there is simply um, not, um, uh, not the sewage capacity uh, to build them. So, Minister, this bill, I believe, is a good step towards ensuring the maximum delivery of social and affordable housing in our, for our citizens, but it's clear as I, as I reference, it's clear that we also need to address the housing shortage, particularly for those areas, areas like Derry and North Belfast, who have suffered from persistent and chronic housing inequality. Minister, you know that to resolve this crisis will require further decisive interventions like the one that's before us today. And in that vein, I would ask, in addition to this legislation, that you also consider in reintroducing the policy of ring fencing new build allocations with robust, robust monitoring so as to ensure that areas that are most in need, like in Derry, and I must include North Belfast, and I say so, I want to call out one of our colleagues who, who has been here, Karen Lee Killen, who has on a number of occasions raised the issues around North Belfast, areas that a priority needs to be delivered for, uh, for social housing. This policy should never have been removed. But unfortunately, and shamefully in my opinion, it was removed by not one, but two SDLP ministers. Margaret Ritchie, first of all, started it, and Alex Atwood shamefully ended it. Hence, I asked you, Minister, to consider reinstating this policy of ring fencing with robust monitoring mechanism to ensure further social housing mm -hmm. is built where social housing is most needed. Thank you all. Thank you. I call Ms. Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I too would like to add my condolences to the family of George Floyd. And um, I would also like to say that the civil rights movement in Derry uh, started based on a housing issue and inequality. Uh, and in, in, in terms of what we are about to speak now, is it is about uh, inequality. Housing is a right, uh, and we should be supporting it. So I just want to say that uh, before I look at the, the bill. This may look like a technical bill, but it is very important, but it is a very important one that we face. Um, it unlocks opportunities for economic growth as we emerge from COVID-19 lockdown. The suspension of the Assembly for three years caused serious and specific difficulties for the social housing sector um, in Northern Ireland. 
the lack of an assembly meant that we were unable to process the legal changes that have been undertaken in Great Britain. In turn, this has restricted the ability of our housing associations to borrow. We have a housing crisis in Northern Ireland. We have a very long waiting list for social housing. Around 38,000 households are on the waiting list, with about 26,000 in of our households um, in housing stress, and more than 12,000 recognised as homelessness. Yet we are building less than 1,000 new social homes per year. At the current rate of progress, it will take several decades to clear the social housing waiting list. This is unacceptable. According to the House of Commons Library, Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK in which the private rental housing sector is larger than the social housing sector. This is a serious problem because parts of the private rental sector are of very poor quality while also being more expensive than social housing. We need housing associations to build large numbers of housing units, meeting the massive need for new homes. This will create substantial numbers of desperately needed jobs. It is, should also come with accredited training schemes helping to strengthen our skills base. My party's hope is that this bill will do more than enabling housing associations to build additional homes and create jobs and training places, but we hope that it will also open up greater use of the financial transaction capital. It is obscene that Northern Ireland underspent its allocation of financial transaction capital by £150 million last year, forgoing the opportunity to spend more money here. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, we want our housing associations to be dynamic organisations, borrowing to invest, building social and affordable homes that are clean and efficient, creating places for people to live, strengthening our communities and providing jobs. My party also wants housing associations to be full and committed participants in the, new green, or in the Green New Deal, cutting carbon emissions, creating a cleaner economy. These opportunities stand before us today. If we had been here sooner in the Assembly, then we would have created more homes earlier, easing our chronic housing problem. This bill would not have to go through an accelerated process because we would have already dealt with this. It was because we were not here in this House is, because, is why we're in the situation in this housing crisis. It's because the DUP and Sinn Féin walked out the door and that's why we're here. But the SDLP, we agree now we're in the right place and uh, we'll move on and we will support this bill. I call Ms Rachel Woods. Speaker, um, whilst I appreciate the need for the reclassification and what this means for the future of social housing in Northern Ireland within our current system, we need to get back on target and we need to provide stimulus for at least 2,000 new social so homes per year. So I hope that this bill does everything that it says on the tin and this forms a part of what we need to, get to do to get out of the housing crisis we have been in for years. I have a few concerns that I would uh, like to raise for the attention of the Minister, if she would not mind addressing them later on. There is an issue with the potential to create inequality in access to both social housing and home ownership, as has already been mentioned by some in this chamber. Many tenants in social homes aspire to home ownership, and the right to buy is often their only hope of fulfilling this aspiration. But administering the social housing allocation system is difficult, but could this change allow for a route for some tenants to home ownership and others not, depending on their landlord? Will this contribute to some tenants consciously turning down a reasonable offer of accommodation when there is no possibility of future home ownership? If this proves to be the case, this will not reduce housing stress on the housing list. The right to buy scheme has been much discussed and debated previously in this chamber. It has been abolished in every other part of the UK, and rightly so. Because of it, we have seen the privatisation of social housing. There has been over 100,000 social homes lost to private ownership, which have not been replaced. And as of March 2019, more than 123,000 homes had been removed from the social housing stock since 1979. Social housing does not exist to provide private homes. Whilst there is reference to the right to buy scheme in this bill in Clause 7, I would like to ask the Minister if she is minded to bring additional legislation to the House in order to extend the cessation or voluntary nature of it to NIHE properties, bearing in mind that there is no voluntary scheme in Scotland or in Wales. If so, I will, yeah. 
I thank the, the member for giving uh, way uh, where a previous speaker wouldn't. I just wonder, uh, following Ms Anderson's scathing critique of the right to buy scheme, would the member concur with me that it's frankly bizarre that she was entirely dismissive of, of remarks raised by myself and others that the scheme should be extended or, or the, the <laughs> I've lost it now that it should be extended to a Northern Ireland housing executive as well, who sell more homes, ten times more homes per year than housing associations. I think the member has made his point, and we'll leave it at that. Um, so, if the, when does the minister envision that this will be? And as a matter, as the matter was consulted on in June 2018, if she thinks that there is need for another public consultation. Clause 8 allows housing association offering a voluntary scheme to receive compensation from the department in the form of a grant. And like Mr Allen has asked, can I ask the minister to outline how this would actually work and what does this look like? Is she of the opinion that the, this could incentivise housing associations to continue to operate a right to buy scheme by a different route, which will increase the pressure on social housing? And where is the oversight? Would she agree that this may reduce the number of homes available to meet housing demand for people who are in need of it? It's kind of quite unclear why this condition is necessary or appropriate in the context of the well-documented pressures in social housing supply, but maybe the Minister can address this. Is this a requirement from the ONS? Furthermore, has there been any consideration of removing Clause 8 at the present time? Would we still meet the conditions required for the reclassification of house associations now? And if so, could it be considered in future legislation alongside the repeal of the statutory house sale scheme in, agreed in regard to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive Properties? Clauses 1 and 2 change the relationship in terms of regulation between the Department and housing associations. And whilst I understand that this is a required part of the reclassification requirements with the ONS, I would like to get assurances that this reclassification, including in this bill, would not result in the deregulation or any regression of departmental oversight. Also on regulation, would the Minister support calls for an independent housing regulator to be set up here, similar to that which exists in the rest of the UK? Whilst I understand that the, establish the establishment of one is not within the scope of this bill, we do need safeguards not only for the tenant but also for the public interest in housing associations and to ensure we have a separate regulator from public policy responsibilities located outside of the government. This would follow best practice in this field as established in Scotland and I would hope that the Minister would seriously consider this and implement it at a later date. Additionally, a new housing strategy has been discussed and was part of the New Decade New Approach document of the Executive Commitments. We do need to provide suitable homes for people who need it, as well as bringing our existing stock up to standard through deep retrofitting in tackling fuel poverty, providing green energy sources and looking and acting on the conditions of properties, which I'm sure many members have experienced living in homes that are not up to standard or been contacted by constituents having to live with, say, serious damp problems, causing health issues to them and their young families, only to be told that they need to keep their windows open longer, or put on a dehumidifier when the conditions of the house will never be good enough without serious works. And this needs to be done through the underlying principle of keeping people in their homes. So I'd be interested to hear of any progress in the development of a new housing strategy, and if any of these issues I have raised are to be addressed within it, perhaps as part of a rolling programme of legislation. Our housing waiting lists are at an unacceptable level, and as of March last year, nearly 38,000 households were on this. We cannot house the people that we need to house. The homelessness figures have been rising, and it's not just about people who are sleeping on the streets, which has taken a global health, global health pandemic to get people to act, but also in temporary accommodation who do not have secure permanent housing. We have significantly reduced the social housing stock, and if we go back to the 1970s, we had 155,000 housing, housing executive homes, and in 2016, around 88,000 plus the 40,000 40, housing association houses, but in 2019, just over 85,000 homes managed by NAHE, with much of this stock need, in need of significant maintenance or indeed replacement. This is not to say that this reduction is solely down to the right to buy, but it has been one major part of it. Therefore, further opportunity exists here because as we look to governance of our housing associations and the changes proposed, we can again look at the governments of the housing executive and the possibility of building new homes again. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, this bill obviously seeks to reverse the 2016 decision um, of the ONS to uh, loosen controls, uh, deregulating and evolving 
right, the bypass uh, to individual housing associations, as, as others have said. Um, the proposals contained in the bill follow a similar pattern to other jurisdictions in Britain, uh, who all face the same reclassification issue and have already returned housing associations to the private sector. Uh, we oppose the main thrust of this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, because it seeks to privatise and deregulate housing associations while at the same time maintaining and possibly increasing the public funding uh, they receive. And when you look at the clauses, uh, clauses 1 and 3, 4, 5 and 6, all restrict the powers of the Department. For example, uh, clauses 1 and 6 change the Department's power from giving consent for the disposal of land uh, or merging housing associations to the housing associations just quote, having to notify the department of their actions. This could see an increase in the ability of housing associations to dispose of more land while merely informing uh, the department along the way, meaning, of course, even less accountability and oversight. Uh, and we know, obviously, that land equals wealth. Um, and we need to have in place a system in which land sale <coughs> or the transfer of land is very tightly monitored, scrutinised uh, and uh, focused on. We know the power and wealth that developers have, and we cannot see a situation where this increases. Uh, aspects of the bill uh, could potentially do so. Uh, so. Worth remembering as well, it wasn't too long ago that we witnessed and we were talking about the NAMA transfer and the scandal associated with that, with £1.2 billion. Pounds uh, transfer of, of property, uh, the biggest transfer in the history, uh, property transfer in, in the history of this state. Um, and uh, at this time, and we're talking about transferring of land, we need a maximum accountability when it comes to uh, this. And this bill proposes to do the exact opposite. Uh, the proposals of the bill um, justified, and I think some members did already, justified on the basis that housing associations, when they are private bodies, can borrow uh, funds that do not count towards the overall public borrow a measure. And this means in theory that the social um, housing grant given the housing associations to build new homes should be leveraged to build more houses than if the Northern Ireland Housing Executive uh, was left on its own to build. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, the reality is very different. Uh, since 1985-86, the housing executive has been banned from borrowing and building homes. In that year, the housing executive built 1,360 homes, uh, and the housing associations built only 1,040. On only two occasions since has the housing association sector built more than the 1996 NIHE benchmark, uh, 2001 uh, and 2012-13. Uh, the, the, mem the memorandum attached to the housing bill uh, claims that in 2019-20, the housing association sector has a target of 1,850 new home starts. This target is simply not credible, as the actual achieved new start level in the previous year was just 980, and the sector has never achieved such a level of new starts, the highest being 1,440 in 2011-12. Uh, the memorandum states that the Department has allocated the Housing Association sector 1, 000, uh, sorry, 146 million for these new homes in 1920. And I would ask, just imagine and uh, just think uh, what the housing, housing Executive could do with £156 million pounds of extra funding, especially if it were allowed to actually build houses. The policy of funding uh, housing associations and not funding the NIHE to build new public housing has been a failure for the last 25 years, and it needs to stop. We should see the housing executive as the main provider of housing here and resist all attempts to run it down, privatise it, or to reduce its funding. We reject the reprivatisation of the housing associations, therefore, and cannot support this bill as it stands. Uh, housing associations should remain as public bodies and be integrated into the uh, housing executive ultimately, uh, becoming subject to full and comprehensive public accountability for the hundreds of millions uh, of public uh, pounds they get uh, every single year. And if housing associations want to return to the private sector, then surely they should not be receiving such vast amounts of public uh, funding. And there are fundamental problems, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with this bill uh, that I've mentioned, them, and we cannot support it for those reasons. If the housing bill does progress, likely to, if it does progress to the second stage, we will explore all options around amending this bill and raise some of these concerns uh, in it. Uh, like I say, we wish to see social housing provision balanced 
uh, more fully towards public spending, and the housing executive uh, playing a key role in that, and challenging the role uh, and the idea that the market knows best and the market should be providing uh, housing generally. Uh, it's worth mentioning, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, that uh, the housing association rents are on a whole cheaper, uh, as the previous member from Foyle said, than the housing executive. The housing executive is more accountable, um, uh, and whilst myself and other members, I'm sure, uh, have regular uh, contact with the housing executive, raising concerns and challenging them, it's a better uh, provider of public housing uh, uh, in general. Uh, the housing executive, as well, worth worth mentioning, in 2017 had 1,000 empty properties. Surely more could be done to. Uh, deal with people who are on the property waiting list and give them a home by uh, fixing these properties up and allocating them to people uh, who need it. So, just in, in conclusion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have heard comments about uh, a new normal uh, in regards to the coronavirus. I do not think the contents of this bill reflect that or reflect the growing appetite uh, of people to see stronger public housing and a stronger housing executive uh, role in that. So, for those reasons, I will be opposing this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargy, to conclude and wind up the debate on the second stage of the bill. Minister. Yeah, thanks very much, and thank you to all members just who have contributed to the debate today. And what, on the face of it, I know it looks um, very technical in terms of the bill, but obviously at the heart of this is um, the access of homes uh, for those in our communities who need it the most. And it is only with the reclassification that we're able um, to deliver more social and affordable homes to our people in the coming years. And all members, I hope, uh, can accept um, that we urgently need to enhance uh, what we deliver, um, and particularly in the commitments of new decade, new approach. This legislation, if passed, will facilitate the reversal of uh, classification of housing associations and see them once again as classified uh, to the private sector thus ensuring that they can continue to be our partners in developing social uh, homes for people. Associations will continue to have discretion over their own borrowing, and the executive will not be constrained by having to provide cover for that borrowing, and much-needed executive funds will not be required to support uh, co-ownership. Um, I suppose just on some of the issues um, that have been raised I suppose in this part of the debate, um, around the bill. I mean, accelerated passage, I feel like I keep uh, getting up in here and saying accelerated passage is not um, the way that I want to do business, and yet everything I've brought has nearly been by accelerated passage. But it's just because of the nature that the issues that I've been dealing with that I've brought forward, uh, the urgency in which I've had to bring things forward, particularly um, because of the pandemic, which happened probably less than six weeks when I took up this post um, of Minister for Communities. Um, and I suppose I make no apologies in terms of this bringing at this time, because there is a financial consequence, which means there would be a consequence on the amount of social houses that could be uh, built, and also a consequence on uh, co-ownership houses. And I know some have touched on that there was a delay in this in 2016. Then why try to delay this until 2021? Why try to delay it then for up to another year when we can move on this now and make those changes to ensure that that 21 million that would otherwise be diverted can go back into the, housing, the social housing development programme? I know there's been a lot of talk in terms of the right to buy. No, you're okay. You've had your say. Um, in terms of the ending of the right to buy, um, and there obviously uh, have been concerns. I suppose the, the clause abolishing this um, is included in ours as it's a compulsory scheme based on legislation. And in short, it evidences the sort of controls that ONS based their decision on. And there's a key difference here than in the other three jurisdictions, in that our scheme is set out in law, and this is not the case elsewhere. So there are particular reasons to the scheme here and what ONS were uniquely saying around the right to buy uh, scheme here at this time. That said, I do want to bring forward, and I said it in my uh, opening speech, that I want to bring forward as soon as possible and in the common period um, considerations looking at the, the right to buy for housing executive properties as well. As someone who grew up in a housing executive property, I still live in a council, a working class um, estate in the market area in South Belfast. I see the impact of that right to buy. We're over 50 per cent 
of the housing in that community has been sold off. Ultimately, when those houses get sold on, it seems like a good idea at the time that people can have ownership. But then when they are sold on, then that creates a, a waiting list in that community where people are living in hostels for five or six years and can't get home. So we do need a wider plan. This reclassification isn't going to fix everything. And I did say that it is my intention to bring forward a wider plan which looks at housing going forward. I've been in from January, folks. We're hit with the, the biggest health pandemic um, that we have seen in our lifetime. And that's going to take a bit longer for those reasons. But I am committed to bringing that forward as quickly as possible. So looking at issues of affordable housing for people who want to, increasing the availability of social housing to ensure those who need it the most get access to it. But to look at other things like uh, cooperative development housing as well, who would also then use private uh, sector entity in terms of borrowing um, also, and I think that's an important point, just like social enterprise. I know some touched on in terms of the rights of housing, and I agree that it should be a priority within the programme for government. Those discussions obviously are still ongoing. Again, because of the COVID pandemic, obviously we're getting back into the everyday business where we were in January. But I will be making obviously strong representations at the executive because I clearly see housing, um, housing rights as human rights and human rights as housing rights, and I'm very clear on that. Obviously, the role of housing and building communities and building sustainable communities is something um, that I really value myself uh, as well in terms of building the vibrancy of communities, but at the same time, ensuring that we do have a housing system that meets those who need it the most and making sure that there are those protections for those who need it the most as well. I know there's been some around uh, Clause 8 in terms of the grants payments. And obviously this is for housing associations only in respect of discount uh, to a tenant in terms of the social home. Terms and conditions for this are still being developed. They're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I will uh, be working with housing associations, but also with others because even in the devisement of this, we have been working with housing associations, the Housing Policy Forum and others, and I'll continue to do that. And again, I know members have uh, raised these issues specifically, and um, our officials are going to keep an eye on who raised that, and we'll ensure that we update uh, members as we go along, as well as the, the committee themselves. In terms of regulation, I mean, these are technical changes, and I, I know it changes things slightly, but some of the issues that were there in terms of oversight and regulations. The department has never had to invoke on housing associations up until this point. And I think the key part is, is that the regulator will continue to have powers uh, to make an intervention. And that engagement um, has to be very critical in the time ahead. In terms of homelessness, um, and uh, I suppose some people raise that in terms of that it's only in the midst of a pandemic. Again, I mean, I acted on homelessness within six weeks of coming into the office in terms of street-based homelessness to ensure that people um, were not out on the street, to ensure that there was temporary accommodation uh, for them. And that's something that I want to build on in the time ahead. But that said, the street-based homelessness doesn't reflect then the even bigger homelessness issue of those who are sofa surfing, those who are in overcrowded accommodation, and indeed who have been in hostels uh, for far, far too long, and particularly, again, in those areas of highest uh, and greatest need. North Belfast was mentioned, Derry was mentioned, there are other areas as well, um, looking at the issues of urban and rural, and indeed that's something that I'm uh, seriously considering, because the housing development programme primarily has to be targeted, at, particularly at those areas of greatest need uh, as well where they have to see delivery, someone waiting eight, nine and ten years on a home is just basically unacceptable and we need to put interventions in place to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, just to end, I know there's been um, a lot of talk in terms of housing as a critical issue. It's a human rights issue and I know some have talked about civil rights. Obviously we are seeing on our screens in terms of the impact of America, um, the issue of NAMA, uh, land and regeneration. And I suppose for me as a minister, um, I'm from a working class community, as I say, I grew up in a housing executive estate. 
and I am proud of my class identity and the community that I have come from. Um, I'm a community activist. I come from parents who were civil rights activists. They helped in the formation of the civil rights um, as early as the late 50s going into the 60s as well in terms of the initial campaigns. And that was even around um, the, the housing in West Belfast at that time um, and surveys that were carried out. And indeed, I do that now um, in the community that I live in. We've taken on NAMA developers. I've went to court to challenge NAMA developers. I've protested on the streets in terms of NAMA development and the impact that that has. So I've been an activist on these issues as well. Um, and of course, I'm attuned to all of those that regeneration, that land, public land particularly, has to be used for the greater public use and shouldn't be sold off just for private development. So I'm in tune with all of these issues, and as I've said before, um, I am keen to engage any member that has recommendations or suggestions, not just in terms of this. I mean, I hope people can understand the reasons as to why I have to bring this piece of legislation, but on the wider housing development programme, because we do have to get it right. We do have to set um, a direction of travel to ensure that we deal with the issues that have been raised in terms of the underinvestment, the restructure and the revitalisation of the housing executive, looking at the, the mixture of housing and tenures and ensuring that those who are in critical need um, have a home over their head. So I do appreciate all of the questions and points of clarity and I suppose points of views that members have raised. And again, my officials are taking a report and where we need to, we'll write separately to those members who have raised specific issues that maybe I haven't particularly answered in the summing up as well. And again, just to remind members that the key elements of the bill, the introduction of a notification process replacing the current consent process, the more specific framing of the circumstances under which an inquiry may be launched, and the ending of the statutory house sales scheme for housing associations. My purpose in bringing forward this legislation is to ensure that housing associations can be returned to private sector classification and with that provide the protection for social housing development and affordable housing programmes. So again, I want to thank members um, up until now in terms of their engagement, their support. I want to thank uh, the committee, obviously, in terms of the deliberations as well. And obviously, I commend uh, the bill for the Assembly's approval. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second stage of the Housing Amendment Bill be agreed. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. Mr Carroll. I will ask the question again, now it is in the record. The question is that the second stage of the Housing Amendment Bill be agreed. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes the second stage of the Housing Amendment Bill. And if members would just take their ease, there would be a change at the top table. Thank you.